All right, welcome to the Second Punic War. Let's pick up from where we left off on the First Punic War. As I mentioned, there's going to be a key person involved from Carthage that's going to play a big role in this, and there's a man named Hannibal. Of the three Punic Wars, usually I think the second is the one that's most well-known. It's probably written about a bit more than the other Punic Wars. Um, it, I, I think it's the most dramatic of the three Punic Wars, and of course everyone's going to have a different opinion on that sometimes. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a fun thing to talk about, a lot of dynamics, and again, you're going to again see how Rome is able to adapt and adopt and, and solve the problem, in this case of this man named Hannibal. So let's go to our kind of key words here. And when we look at the second Punic War keywords that I want you to know is obviously you got the dates again, you don't need to memorize the dates. Livy, Livy is the primary source, right? So here's Livy, he writes this book called The War with Hannibal. Um, and I'll be referring to it as I talk about the Second Punic War. There are obviously other sources we have on the Second Punic War, but Livy is a good one. Um, Gaul is a region over here. If you're not familiar with the area of Gaul, it's uh, what modern day France is. I think I've used that term before. The Rhone River is a river that runs right through it over here. Uh, the Alps, of course, right up here in north, er, northern part of um, Italy. Um, then I'll talk about Battle of Cannae, Mani and Fabius Maximus, Scipio Africanus, Battle of Zama. So as always, get all these words down. And as I talk about them, know the details and so forth. So what triggers the Second Punic War? Well, obviously, you know, the First Punic War, uh, and this man named Hannibal comes in. He's a very powerful military leader of, of Carthage. And what we're going to start to see is Carthage moving its influence into Spain. There's a city, in fact, here on this map called New Carthage. And as this begins to happen, this is going to definitely create a bit more tension between Rome and Carthage. So, you know, there's different interpretations of how all this started. Uh, perhaps it was just Hannibal really upset with Rome from the First Punic War. This issue of who's going to have more influence over Carthage. You know, wars are rarely fought for just one reason, uh, but it is going to lead to a big conflict. What we are definitely going to see in the Second Punic War is Hannibal is going to be definitely the aggressor from the beginning of this war. He's going to go after Rome in a way that really was not something Rome had seen before, I think, in, in this fashion. So this is going to be kind of an interesting event. Let me show you a picture of Hannibal and then talk about what his plan is, and then I'll come back to a map to talk about the war. So this is just a bust of Hannibal, and Hannibal is going to organize a massive force, tens of thousands of men, uh, cavalry forces, uh, but, you know, one of the most famous things Hannibal is known for using in the Second Punic War are going to be elephants. And in fact, if you look at coins from the Carthaginian period, this is what you see. Let me show you in this next image here. You see coins and you see Hannibal on one side and you see elephants on the other. And, you know, normally if you put something on a coin on a civilization, it tells you it's pretty important. Now, the thing is, you know, he's known for the elephants, but as I talk about this route he's going to take to attack Rome, by the time he gets to Rome, he probably doesn't have, you know, massive number of elephants left with him, and you'll see why in a second, uh, but he is, it is definitely something he's known for doing. So what exactly is Hannibal going to do? How is he going to launch this invasion into Rome and, you know, be a big part of the Second Punic War? So let me go to our map again. And this map kind of traces what Hannibal is going to do. Hannibal's route, and you can see it's in green. So we start over here, and, you know, you see the green area here uh, in Spain. And he's going to move into that area of Gaul I mentioned before. He has to cross a number of rivers, like that Rhone River, that, again, that term that I want you to know. And then he's going to kind of zigzag through the Alps. He's going to go down and try to invade, you know, Italy itself. So this is... is pretty ambitious, right? This is uh, 18, 15, 16, 17, 1800 mile trek, something like that. Um, and think of the terrain he has to cross with his horses, with his men, and with his elephants. And, you know, as I, as I show this map to, to my students, I ask them, you know, what challenge is he going to have? And the first thing usually people say is, well, the Alps, how are the elephants going to cross the Alps? But he's got another problem. He's got to cross rivers. And how do you cross rivers with elephants? And so 
you know, the question is, what do they do? How do you actually cross the rivers? How do you cross and uh, cross? And so what I turn to is Livy, the primary source. I'm actually just going to read to you here directly from the primary source we have on this battle, um, on this war. And, you know, I want you to listen carefully and see if what I'm explaining even sounds feasible. All right. So here we go. He says, various methods were, I believed employed to get uh, the elephants across the river. At any rate, there are differing accounts of how it was done. According to one account, the beasts were herded close to the bank, and a notable ferocious one was then goaded by his driver, who promptly plunged into the water. The furious animal pursued him as he swam for his life and, strode, and, and so drew the rest of the herd after him. Despite their terror at finding themselves in deep water, they were all carried to the farther bank by the sheer force of the current. So he's saying one possibility is, is that they swam across the river. So just kind of hold on to that thought for a second, elephant swimming. It is more generally thought that they were ferried across on rafts, surely a safer method and also to judge by the results a more likely one. The method was to prepare a big float 200 feet long and 50 feet wide, which was held in position against the current by a number of strong cables led to the bank upstream. It was then covered with soil like a bridge to induce the elephants to walk on it without fear as they were still on land. All right, so either some big old raft or swimming and people go, yeah, can elephants actually swim? Well, I'll give you a little fun thing to do. Just go on YouTube or something and just type elephant swimming. And as you do that, if you want, you could pause and go do that now. And then you can come back and you go, my goodness, yes, elephants can swim. So, yes, they can swim. It's a weird thing to look at. I, I always love showing in my in-class lectures. I actually kind of bring it up and I show it to students. Uh, but, yeah, so regardless, he gets them through the rivers. But the Alps, you know, I guess elephants can swim, but they probably don't do mountains well. And so by the time he gets deep into Italy, he probably doesn't have that many elephants with him. But he's got a very good cavalry, very good infantryman, and he's a very smart military general. And you see this major battle. And again, this being a survey course, I don't go into every detail of this battle. There's there's places where you can find a lot more details about these uh, wars that I'm giving you with a lot more information. Uh, but there's this battle known as the Battle of Cannae, right? And it's in 216. He starts the campaign around the year 218, right? So it takes him a couple years. Now, this battle is pretty ferocious and it does not go well for the Romans. Let me show you. So here's just a graphic I found kind of illustrating the stages of the Battle of Cannae. And what Hannibal is going to do is implement, sometimes I've heard it referred to as a step format or a crescent format, and you could see him here in the red. And he's going to use, there's a river there at the Battle of Cannae as well, the Roman forces are up here in the pink, and he's down here in the red. And apparently he kind of worked his formation where it's going to be easy. For, he, he allowed the Romans to move forward and it's going to be easy for his men to fall back. And he had a lot more men on the edges and he's going to basically trap the Romans. As the Romans move deep, he outflanks them and almost, you know, surrounds them over here. And as he begins to surround the Romans, the Romans are going to suffer heavy casualties. Tens of thousands of Romans are going to fall at the Battle of Cannae. So this is not looking good for Rome right now, right? I mean, you have Rome, you know, you got this guy Hannibal, he's just launched this massive campaign, he's defeated the equivalent of several Roman legions, um, and Rome is in trouble. And it's only two years into the war, and the question is, is how is Rome going to adapt and solve this problem? Well, let's go on to our next story and explain how this happens here in our next slide. So what Rome is going to do is they're going to have a couple of generals, and I put their names up before. One is a man named Fabius Maximus. And Fabius Maximus, he's going to use something known as Fabian tactics to fight against Hannibal. What are Fabian tactics? A lot of you have heard of Fabian tactics. It just goes by another name guerrilla warfare. And what we mean by that is, you know, you don't fight your army against his army head to head. You, you hit at night, you wait for Hannibal's men to go on patrol. Um, is this going to defeat Hannibal? No, but it buys him time. It gives him some moral victories. There are some people in Rome who question this tactic, actually, but it did seem to, to at least give Rome some time. 
some time for this guy named Scipio. Because Scipio, who later becomes known as Scipio Africanus, and you'll see why, he's going to be the general, the Roman general. So Scipio, like Fabius was a Roman general, so is Scipio. Scipio is going to really implement some important changes in fighting Hannibal. He's going to change some of the weaponry that the Romans used. He's going to uh, look at Hannibal's formation, and he's going to... Uh, kind of study that and change the Roman formation. So this is what I mean by adapting and adopting, bringing in new weapons. I believe he started to use what's called the Spanish longsword, which is kind of a, a longer sword that worked more effectively against um, against Rome, uh, against Carthage. Um, and then again, changing the formation he used. But maybe the most important thing he's going to do is leave Rome. And Scipio, as you can see here, is going to take the fight to... Carthage. And eventually, again, I'm skipping a lot of the key events because, you know, just being a survey class, um, he gets to Africa. And in northern Africa, we get to the year 202. And in the year 202, you have this other battle called the Battle of Zama. And as a result of this battle, the Romans win again. The Romans are able to defeat Hannibal at the Battle of Zama. All right, and then after the battle, essentially, you know, the Romans are going to be victorious and um, Hannibal is going to lose. Uh, it takes him a little while. Eventually, the stories go that Hannibal was eventually going to be captured by the Romans and he took poison. Uh, there are different accounts of what happened to him, but he, of course, is going to lose the influence after this point. So the Romans win the Second Punic War. Their influence is going to grow. They don't like take over Spain all the next day. It's going to take them a little while, but their influence is going to continue to grow around the Mediterranean Sea. All right, so First Punic War, Romans end up winning. Second Punic War, pretty bloody. Romans end up winning. Uh, question is, is this the end? And the answer is not quite the end because there's one more Punic War and as, I, as we're going to see, it's going to be the one I spend the least time talking about, but something big happens. And so just uh, we'll do this in a quick, short uh, third lecture here. So just uh, go ahead and click on the next one and you can watch the third Punic War and see what happens there and how this three Punic War story ends. All right. Thank you.